Do you remember any of the L.Y. song? Um, okay, yes. I remember it. It's like something Lee, something right. Lee, something L.Y. Why? Hello world, there's a song that we're singing. Come on, get happy. A whole lot of love and it's what we'll be bringing. We'll make you happy. Welcome to the Pop Culture Preservation Society, the podcast for people born in the big wheel generation who know exactly how many ways there are to leave your lover. We believe our Gen X childhoods gave us unforgettable songs, stories, characters, and images. And if we don't talk about them, they'll disappear, like Marshall, Will, and Holly on a routine expedition. And today, we'll be saving the absolute grooviest way to increase your phonemic awareness, the electric company. I'm Carolyn. I'm Kristen. And I'm Michelle. And we are your pop culture preservationists. We'll make you happy. We're gonna turn it on. We're gonna bring you the power. It's coming down the line. Strong as it can be. To the courtesy of the electric company. The electric company. Hey, you guys. How many times do you think you've said the words, hey, you guys, in your lifetime? Hey, you guys. Hey, you guys. Hey, you guys. Hey, you guys! Rita Moreno's Hey, You Guys is legendary. It was a clarion call to the children of the 70s who were too cool for Sesame Street, but still had some phonemes to learn. The 70s was the golden age of educational programming, and Electric Company exploded at the intersection of educational and 70s. It was so 70s. It was psychedelic and groovy and wry and funny, and there were cool bell bottoms and lots of awesome hair, including long straight down your back styles and big beautiful afros, and there was music that people danced to and far out animation and lots and lots of words. We were learning how to put sounds together to make words, and we didn't even know it. You guys, Electric Company was my jam. Mm -hmm. It was my jam. But you know what's interesting? It's interesting... I feel like I am the poster child for the children's television workshop progression (laughs) because I had afternoon kindergarten. So in 1974, um, I would watch Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers and Electric Company before school. And I distinctly remember that I still loved Sesame Street, Mm -hmm. but I remember thinking Electric Company was where it was at. (laughs) Totally. I mean, but you know what? That makes sense because Electric Company was targeted at emerging readers who were starting to get too sophisticated for Sesame Street. And mm-hmm. even at five and a half years old, that was totally me. Yeah. Um, I found I found it so exciting. I thought the skits and the cast, the recurring characters, they were my first teachers. Yeah, they really yeah, were. Definitely. And I yeah. they were the coolest. They were mm-hmm. the coolest teachers. And I adored them. Mm-hmm. Well, I adored Electric Company as well. And as you all know, um, I wasn't as much of a Sesame Street fan because of those talking animals, you know, like oh, I like right. real people. Oh my God. So, they were fake, Carolyn. They, did you know they were fake? I know, but they, still, there was a giant bird and, and all of that. It's just, I like the real people. So electric. It was disconcerting to you. It was. It was. And I just thought it was mm-hmm. kind of babyish and childish. I think I was mm-hmm. mature for my age. And so Electric Company was, as you so eloquently put it, Michelle, it was my jam as well. Um, <laughs> it was cool, like Kristen said, with this groovy vibe. And I felt really kind of grown up watching it because mm-hmm. it reminded me, I guess, of the sketches that my parents would see on Laugh-In or the Carol right. Burnett show. And well, so they call I thought, it that. They call mm-hmm. it the educational yeah. laugh in is what they mm-hmm. actually kind of modeled it after. Right. So I think I felt like I was in on something that the adults were in on and I felt kind of cool about that. And I know that I really enjoyed the humor and particularly the wordplay and mm-hmm. the puns. Oh, yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. Fargo, day, North oh my gosh. Dakota. And hey. I think I get nipple lightning now when I think <laughs> about the clever <laughs> ways that the writers incorporated Wait. wordplay. I was just going to say, do you think that's where it all started? I do. And as you have mm-hmm. so astutely pointed out, wordplay is my foreplay. That's so, right. <laughs> it's so I'm, true. You, and I'm going to get Carolyn a shirt that says wordplay mm, is my yes. foreplay. I don't think it would be a stretch to say that my fondness for wordplay began with the electric company. 
it was funny in a trendy way. It was a very of the moment kind of thing. And they were really speaking to the things that we were tuned into at the moment. Do you remember Steve Awesome, the $6.39 man? <laughs> And then you would have this super hip, cool voice. And so the the opening to the segment was, Steve Awesome, accident prone, a man barely alive. We can rebuild him. We have permission. We can make him better, stronger, more fun at parties. (laughs) Steve Awesome, the $6.39 man. I just thought that was the funniest thing I've ever heard. One thing that dogged me literally until yesterday, for my entire life, I have always wondered what the turnip sea was. I'm like, where the hell is the turnip sea? And that's because in the opening of the show, the song says, we're coming down the line, strong as they can be, through the turnip sea of the electric company. Okay, you guys are just staring at me. No, because talking about misheard lyrics, (laughs) I've always thought it was for eternity. Oh, okay. Well, you're closer than I was. It's not, there is no turnip sea. It was, it's coming down the lines strong as they can be through the courtesy of the electric electric company. company. Yeah. I mean, that's as bad as England, Dan and John Ford Coley. And (laughs) I'm not talking about moving in. Yeah. Courtesy. I thought, and this, my entire life, I've wondered where the turnip sea is. The turnip sea. And I've always thought it was through to eternity. Look at yeah, that. That makes more Well, I'm sorry. I'm just okay, seeing well. this turnip in the shape of a C, like the vegetable turnip. <laughs> right. I, oh, no. C. I thought but, it was like the Caspian Sea, the turnip <laughs> sea. Like there's a resort on the turnip sea. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> We're funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys. I'm glad we think we are. Kind of. Right. Hey, you guys. Believe it or not, (laughs) the electric company is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year, right now. Can you believe that? I cannot believe I didn't put... This is total coincidence, you guys. We did not plan this. I know. It's amazing. It's It's like the Brady Bunch episode. It's the 50th anniversary. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So on October 25th, 1971, the first of its 780 episodes... Oh, my God. I know. ...appeared on our TV screens. And actually, the show was created after the U.S. Department of Education approached the Children's Television Workshop, who at the time was producing Sesame Street, and the Department of Ed requested that they create a TV program that would support the department's Right to Read initiative, which had the goal of eliminating illiteracy ahead of the nation's bicentennial in 1976. Oh, they had a deadline. Mm-hmm. They did. Like, I guess oh, my goodness. Every American was going to go ha- know how to read on July 4th, 1976. <laughs> <laughs> the Bicentennial Readathon. <laughs> That's right. So one of the groups they wanted to target was um, students between the ages of 7 to 10 who um, were struggling readers, basically. I mean, that was really who this program was aimed for. But of course, the early mature readers like Michelle and myself and Chris and probably you too, we <laughs> oh, were of course, of we course. weren't quite seven, but we were already on there reading right along with um, with all the characters. So Joan Gans Cooney, who was founder of the Children's Television Workshop, assembled a team to create this show. And she not only assembled the team, but she had that team assemble more than 100 experts to work on the pre-planning of the show. It is Like probably, educational experts? Yes. Mm-hmm. Not okay. educational experts, psychologists, reading instructors, also television and film production experts. It appears to be maybe one of the most researched educational mm-hmm. programs in the history of television. Wow, and crazy. those experts were involved in the pre-planning as well as all the way through the six seasons of The Electric Company. Oh, they stuck with it they did. throughout the entire run. It wasn't just at the outset of the creation. Correct. Of all oh, of wow. the skits, all of the sketches, the writing, all of that went through um, yes. varied experts before we actually saw it on our TV screen and before it was handed to the actors um, and wow. their scripts. So and it's, um, it's interesting because I think that like we can watch it and when we watch it as kids, certainly, but even now watching it back clips on YouTube, they just, you know, they're so silly and frivolous and they make us laugh. But every single thing, even down to all of the animation, everything yes. was so intentional and it yes, was it done is. with such mm-hmm. thought that they did such a good job then of making it just seem like this silly, exactly. this silly show. Mm-hmm. But I was really surprised to learn that, Carolyn, that it just seems so slick because the sets are kind of like cardboard. Like every time they open a door yeah, on the electric right. company, you think the whole wall is going to fall down because <laughs> basically, so it almost looks like they're working on this shoestring budget. However, really, 
what they were doing was, like I just said, was so intentional and was yeah. so researched. Um, and that's why it was so successful. Oh, yeah. And, but the difference between Sesame Street and Electric Company, which I never perceived, Sesame Street taught us a whole host mm-hmm. of concepts, letter concepts, number right. concepts, you know, all sorts of different things. And um, But Electric Company was just reading. Solely. It was yep. incredibly right. focused. And that mm-hmm. never occurred to me until I just started doing my research now. Yep. It was, and not even... Um, just reading focused, but really phoneme focused right. on letter combinations and letter sounds. It was, like you said, intentional is the best word for it. And I think it was Joan Gans Cooney, who, um, like Carolyn said at the time, was the president of the Children's Television Workshop. She um, she was saying that, yeah, while Sesame Street did teach more like values, everything from kindness and sharing mm-hmm. and families and all these different almost issues that children preschool are mm-hmm. they're mm-hmm. working on. Yeah. Electric company, it all just boiled down to one thing. They had one goal. <laughs> We're going to teach them one to read. Yeah. goal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And I did think it was interesting too, since the three of us were in, are involved in education in our previous lives, so to speak. But um, there was even this, the controversy, as there was when I was a teacher, between um, the phonemic way to teach reading versus mm-hmm. the whole um, language aspect of teaching mm-hmm. reading. And so I would venture to say the three of us grew up with sounding out the words and yeah, I did definitely. Um, yeah, right. and that type of uh, strategy. But there was also this, the other strategy of the whole word and learning through context clues. And, um, and they struggled, or not struggled, but they um, grappled with that as well. Obviously, the Sesame Street was the first born child out of Children's Television Workshop, but Electric Company wasn't really related. I think some people like to think it was a spinoff or a distant mm-hmm. cousin, but really it was its own. It was its own unique show, and it utilized mm-hmm. sketch comedy, improvisation, mm-hmm. and these variety show like skits. I mean, the cast members were trained in bra- on Broadway. They were musical. Mm-hmm. Um, some of those included people like I don't know who Michelle. Who else? Who was on there? Yeah. Um, well, it was a uh, it was quite a roster, right? Yes, mm-hmm. like, and I think a lot of us forget that. But yeah, um, exactly. The so the children's television workshop they wanted they set out to create a repertory company, and I mean, boy, did they! Right? right, they created a cast that was so diverse and just so bold. I think for the time, That's so a good most word for it. most notable we have uh, Rita Moreno who was already a very well-known actress. Uh, she, um, I think up to then, um, one of her notable roles had been in Singing in the Rain in 1952, so full, almost 20 years earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, she played, if you guys forget, in that movie, she played silent film star Zelda Zanders. Um, and then 10 years prior, she had won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actress for playing Anita in West Side Story. I like to be in America, okay by me in America. Um, this woman, too, by the way, my God, does she age? Is she 90 something? She's 90 something. She's, and she's on a sitcom right now. And yeah, she's, like she's covering near 90. She's hilarious on, yes. on One Day at a Time right now. And she's gorgeous. Her gorgeous. skin, the fountain of youth. A few years ago, in an interview she did for the Archive of American Television, she said that when she was asked to become a cast member of Electric Company, she didn't hesitate for a second. She really? said. There was, yeah, she said there was nothing like it on television. It had wit. Children's shows didn't have that kind of sophisticated wit that yes. Electric Company did. It was very sophisticated. Yes. Mm-hmm. And witty. That's my, I just, that's the thing yes. that got me was that yes. clever wit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. She, um, she said she really admired Joan Gantz Cooney's um, mission that, yes, we want to teach kids. But we need to engage them first. And that yeah. just sold her. Plus, she said the fabulous cast uh, made it very easy for her to join. Um, and don't forget that Rita Moreno, who is responsible for, hey, you guys. Uh-huh. And that didn't, that was not intended to be a clarion call. It comes from one of the characters that she created on Electric Company, who uh-huh. is Millie the Helper, who's delivering milk at 4.30 in the morning, and she needs to be very quiet. Listen, do I have to get up early like this every morning? Of course you do. You want to be a milkman? People want their milk early in the morning. First thing, give them their milk. Oh, well, go. Yeah, yeah, sure. You're right. So well, 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 what do I do next? Well, you have to find out just how much milk they want. Uh, oh, sure. That's easy. Hey, you she just starts shouting, hey, you guys, mm-hmm. at 4.30 in the morning. Mm-hmm. And people 
by people, it must be children, were so in love with her shouting this when she's, oh, it's so naughty and she's supposed to be quiet <laughs> that they ended up putting that in the theme song. In the first year, that Hey You Guys was not in the Mm-mm. theme song. Mm-mm. Oh, wow. And now it's probably one of the most recognizable um, things about Electric Company. Um, yeah. A couple other of her best known characters, Otto the director and the naughty little girl Pandora with the Nellie Olson wig. And we'll talk mm-hmm. about characters coming up in a minute. Mm-hmm. Um some of my favorite, uh, Rita Moreno played some of my favorite characters on Electric Company for sure. Um, and then we have Bill Cosby, who, um, yes, we need to go there, everyone, because yeah, despite we what Sorry. we all, yeah, what we all may think of Bill Cosby now, um, he was important in Electric Company history. You can't deny that. Um, and in our memories of it, he's there, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, so Bill Cosby was, he was really one of the first ones they cast because they wanted a superstar. They wanted someone mm-hmm. who was going to be a name. Um, and he was already a certified superstar for I Spy um, and Stand Up. Um, and then and in lots 19... of albums. He'd had huge comedy lots albums. Lots of comedy albums. Time. Yeah. Yep. Right. He got his master's in education during the filming of Electric Company. Um, you guys, I find it really interesting that the Electric Company is not mentioned at all on Bill Cosby's Wikipedia page. They've just erased what? it from his uh, Wikipedia page. Mm-hmm. He was actually, well, he was only on the show for one season. Mm-hmm. Um, he only was on it the first season. His recurring characters were replayed all the time in other seasons. Right. Mm-hmm. But if you go on Wikipedia, it doesn't mention Electric Company. That's really interesting. Whose choice was that, do you think? I was under the impression that, you know, this is a chicken or the egg story, that Electric Company was his motivation for becoming this educational expert. Like you said, he started to get a master's in education at that time. And that's why you always see, you know, Dr. William H. Cosby on mm-hmm. all of his all of his credits. Mm-hmm. And he got his honorary doctorate. So he has a master's, but his doctor is an honorary doctorate for Fat Albert, which he created out of a need to continue to serve people right. educationally. So I'm wondering, did he come to Electric Company just as a comedy performer and then become an educator? I don't know if we really know the answer to that. But yeah, Fat, uh, Fat a Albert question. followed immediately from 72 yeah. to 79. So that was um, probably the reason he left, I'm assuming. Right. I don't know. Now let's talk about Morgan Freeman. Morgan yes, Freeman yes. is noted mostly for his serious roles. I'm just going to mention a few. Driving Miss Daisy, Unforgiven, Shawshank Redemption, Million Dollar Baby. Um, but it's sometimes surprising when us Gen Xers remember that Electric Company is where we were first introduced to Morgan Freeman. Okay, brothers and sisters and misses and misters, here's your daddy yo with the sounds to go. No shucking, no jiving. I'm telling you, your music's arriving. Ha ha! What I say? It's Mel Mounds here with our special request game called The Same As It's your actually name. where he made a name for himself and rose to fame. Because he was nobody before that. I mean, he, I'm assuming he was a stage actor and did important yes. things. Yeah, he but did. nobody yep. knew who he was. Right. So this is how we know him. And my God, the cool factor that he brought oh my to gosh. that show right, cannot right. be overstated. I mean, the sweet bells and the give me five and the way he strutted, like he was not dumbing it down for the Mm-mm, kids. No. He was well, bringing it. Um, this is interesting because you see a lot of his um, training in those cool characters. He had studied mm-hmm. theater in Los Angeles and had already appeared in off-Broadway stage productions prior to Electric Company. But he worked as a dancer at the 1964 World's Fair, and he was a member of the Opera Ring Musical Theater Group in San Francisco. So he oh, comes wow. to Electric Company with this really wonderful and well-rounded training, not only as a yeah. serious actor, but as a dancer and a musical p- theater performer. And if you go back and watch his um his most you know his well known characters on electric company which we we can talk about easy reader which we will in, in a little bit mellow mel the dj count dracula all of these things you see the influences i think of all of that training you really do. Mm-hmm. He kind of blended yeah. it all together. Um, Morgan Freeman quit the electric company in 1975 because according to wikipedia um <laughs> the work was tiring he said but you know what you guys i call bullshit you know why oh because nothing tires Morgan Freeman, <laughs> right? <laughs> He's Morgan effing Freeman. <laughs> but it nothing was Nothing tires that man. I mean, remember, the reason that they got 780 episodes in six years is because that was a daily show. And their schedule was punishing. It was truly punishing. So I don't know. I'm kind of going would, for it. Yeah, they would film in 13 weeks. They filmed 130 episodes. <gasps> My God. Mm-hmm. Then, of course, we have um, 
not well-known names to us, but these were important people to us mm-hmm, in mm-hmm. the first few seasons. We have Skip Hennant, um, best known for Fargo, North Dakota. Um, and he was the boy in the soap opera, The Love of Chair. Um, and he <laughs> actually, fun fact about Skip Hennant is that his first major role was as Kathy's boyfriend, Ted, on the Patty Duke show. Oh. Which was in 1963 and 65. And he originated the role of Schroeder in the off-Broadway cast of Your Good Man, Charlie Brown. Hmm. Um, and then I love Lee Chamberlain. She, you will know her on Electric Company I as Vi from Vi's she has Diner. That, she has the space between her oh, teeth. I love gorgeous. that space. I wanted a space between my teeth because of her. Mm-hmm. She gorgeous. is Drop dead gorgeous, sassy. She has that beautiful afro. Mm-hmm. Um, she had just done some previous acting work in New York. Um, we've got Judy. I'm not going to say her last name right. I'm just going to say Judy Graubart. G R O B A R T. Graubart. Thank you. Oh, yes. thank you. Oh, thank you. you. I actually went down a Judy Graubart rabbit hole. All I really know about her is she was an alum of Second City, which you know back in back in yeah. the late '60s she was. She in has Second a City very in like she has a very Gilda Radner feel to her. Totally. I think. When I watch yes. her, I'm like, why does she remind? Of. It's Gilda Radner. I listened to a great podcast that I'm going to include in our links where it was from Comic Book Central, and okay. they interviewed a bunch of cast members from Electric Company last year, and Judy was one of them, and he was asking if she got any of her inspiration from Goldie Hawn from Laugh-In. Oh. And while she said she didn't, she could see a lot of similarities between the way that they acted that kind of ditzy, that ditziness that she portrayed and that she felt like Goldie Hawn might have been inspired by her. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> you go, Judy. There you go. But, to, but the fact that they were looking at a Second City alum for their cast shows you how, where their, where their priority was. Like this mm-hmm. has to be not just cute, this has to be funny. And when we say funny, we mean funny even for adults. Mm-hmm. Again, not dumbing it down for the kids. Mm-hmm. This is legit. And then right. they had some pretty serious people coming on for cameos too, didn't they? Yeah, there were. Um, I have a long list, but um, there were just some you know, celebrities who made guest appearances on the show and some of the more notable ones, um, Carol Burnett, Barbara Eden, uh, Lauren Green, Michael Landon, Dean Martin, oh, Lily Tomlin. Michael Landon. I know. Oh I wonder goodness. what he was. Lily Tomlin, and of course, some of the Sesame Street puppets would show up on um, Electric Company randomly, like Big Remember Bird. Remember when Grover and got Grover, lost, He was you guys? lost, and he oh showed up God. at Vice Diner. I'm, I'm lost? Oh, oh. Uh, t- 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 hey, it's all right. I, uh, where, where do you live, young fella? What do you mean, where do I live? I just said I was lost. If I knew where I live, I'd be there. I, I'm really lost. I've been walking around for hours. Oh, my heart yeah. broke when Grover was uh-huh. lost at Vice Diner. Oh. And um, I loved it when the Sesame Street... You know, Carolyn, how you always say you love it when um, stars from one show <laughs> yes. merge with another one? That was like... That was just so exciting to me when all of a sudden, you know, here would be Grover or Oscar the Grouch or Big Bird on the electric company. Visiting at the electric Mm -hmm. company. And so often those cameos, well, and correct me if I'm wrong, but they donated their time, didn't they? Oh, I don't know. I think I I read that. I think they did not ask for Yeah, they were not paid. They did this, you know, for, you know, for the people. And often I think we didn't see them. We heard them, and so you couldn't even say that they were doing it for good PR or to get people to watch their shows. They're just doing it because, you know, they're doing it for the kids. And one that I remember all the time because it was a piece of animation, but it was Mel Brooks who did this piece of animation. Mm -hmm. And, of course, we as children all knew the voice of Mel Brooks. We don't know who the hell this guy is, but we know his voice from Free to Be You and Me because he's the baby who doesn't know if he's a boy or a girl. Mm -hmm. But on Electric Company, he basically plays the same role. He's a guy Mm -hmm. who's really confused about something and he's given a sentence that's all mixed up and he reads and he's like i am cute very no 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 that's not it and the little animated character has to figure it out yeah. but as children that voice is an indelible voice i very am cute the proper way to say it is i am very cute boy to get a compliment around here you really have to work for it and now a break for station identification Do you enjoy our conversations? Do you find yourself nodding in agreement or laughing along with us or even talking back to us in your car, on your treadmill, or while you cook dinner? Would you like to help us make sure others can get that feel-good feeling too? It's super easy. All you have to do is go to where you listen and follow or subscribe to our podcast, 
Click the stars, five is nice, and leave a lovely review. And then, and this is even easier, share our story with friends via social media, text, email, or even, and I know this sounds crazy, word of mouth. It is the only way we know we are getting heard and the very best way for you to tell us that you want to hear more. Thank you. And now, back to our regularly scheduled programming. My favorite cast members, for sure, which will not surprise you at all, were the people in the Short Circus, which was a pun on Short Circuit. I love it. Which was, I know, isn't that great? But I had no idea. I did not know. Um, They were a five-member singing group whose songs also facilitated reading comprehension. In hot pants and (laughs) go-go boots, you guys, and tambourines. Everybody take a trip today. About the dance, it's going to come your way. What you doing here and listen to me? It's moving faster than a rain. I could hardly stand it. This was like where I lived. I loved them so much. And my favorite was June Angela. They had a rotating group of cast members on the short circus, but June Angela was the only one who stayed with it all six seasons. Um, all six seasons, all 780 episodes. And she chose the name Julie for her character. I don't think they ever even said the names on the show, but they had to have alternate names. So she chose the name Julie as her character's name to honor Julie Andrews. Oh. Um, yeah. So I loved how her, I loved how her bangs would flip when she danced. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> she would just dance like her moves were just legendary and you know how dancing in the early late 60s and early yeah. 70s was like really jerky and kind it's of primal it's all go-go they all it's look like totally go-go and her the- bangs would flip wildly <laughs> yeah. when she was just like messing around the um, choreography but- is very much like they should be in cages at a dance <laughs> absolutely. club absolutely i mm-hmm. love it it's that it. laugh oh in God. that laugh in part it's, you remember yes this? Yes, yeah, it's just like exactly laugh-in. because mm-hmm. like they wanted this to be the educational laugh in. Yeah. Even the choreography of the short circus was very laugh in. Totally, you're right. And I was eating it up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And June Angela came with some very serious chops, even as a child. She was the youngest soloist soprano at the New York City Opera at the age of ten. Whoa! Oh wow! Yes, yes, and she still holds that honor. She's the and then she comes to audition for Electric Company, but she actually had difficulty getting an audition for the Electric Company because the casting call was asking for black and white children, and she was Asian. And her agent was like, "Come on, just give her an audition." And of course, they took her, and she stayed with the show the entire time. So she grew up, and she went on to have a very successful Broadway career, which makes me super happy. Get this, you guys. I can't even believe this. How could this be happening, and we don't even know? She is currently, today, on Fresh Off the Boat. She plays the family's psychic. So here we have the girl from Electric Company that I idolized and wanted to be with my tambourine, and she's been right in front of my face this whole time, and I didn't even know it. But there are some other cool members of um, the Short Circus as well. Carolyn, would you like to tell us about Denise Nickerson? (laughs) Yes, I would, because I had this moment where Kristen had sent me some clips to look at for Electric Company, and so I was going down that rabbit hole. And the first one I saw of the Short Circus, it was a screen, the screen was on and there was this face on there. And I was like, I got this tingle. I can't say it's nipple lightning, but something kind of in my throat. And I was like, I know who is, I know this person. It was just like this wash of nostalgia because I recognized her from Electric Company, but there were all these other synapses going off in my head. And I was telling Kristen about that. And she said, oh, just do a little research and see what you find out. (laughs) So I was um, like, this is going to make your day, Carolyn. (laughs) This would be um, Denise Nickerson is the actress's name. She actually had um, in her hair, she had that kind of half pullback ponytail with our favorite like yarn ribbon in it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and mm-hmm. she was kind of, kind of seemed like the head singer to me, the lead singer. And she did a lot of singing. She, I think she was only on one season, perhaps. But anyway, Carolyn goes down the rabbit hole. Denise Nickerson is also known as Violet Beauregard from <gasps> Willy Wonka. Yes. <laughs> okay, so most surprising of all. most I cannot believe I did not know this. I cannot believe it. The most surprising cast member of the short circus, Irene Cara. Yes! 
Irene Cara was a member of the Short Circus. She played the keyboard and she sang and she, I'm dancing again because <laughs> they were such cool dancers. How do we not know this? Oh, wow. I As preservationists, know. I feel a little te- taken aback. Like mm-hmm. somebody was hiding it from us. Wow. What a feeling. <laughs> am I right? <laughs> the big question is, did this work? Did this big initiative work? Do you guys feel like it impacted your reading ability or even your desire to read? Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Without a doubt. I do too. I would even say that as a former teacher, I can now see all their tricks and all their methods, you know, watching it back now. And honestly, they were just tremendous tools. I saw a stat that said, so, you know, they use the electric company in a lot of elementary schools um, in the early 70s. And schools that used electric company increased their reader skills by 400%. 400%. Oh my mm-hmm. gosh. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, and they needed to do, they needed that, that information because remember, this is a publicly funded initiative. So if they couldn't, we can all say good things about electric company and how we felt like it helped us, but if they couldn't show those numerical results, they couldn't get their funding. So they mm-hmm. needed to be able to prove that it was actually helping them, the actual children learn how to read. So literally thousands of schools bought new television sets just for this purpose, to show the kids in their classes electric company starting in 1971. They estimate that there were 2 million million children were watching electric company in school in the fall of 1971, and millions more saw it in the late afternoon when they got home. I mean, that's a pretty good reach. Wow, Mm -hmm. that's great. And I was, um, I read another unique program, a way they use the electric company, was they brought it into prisons. There were several prisons around the country that when... um, Inmates, when their children would visit, they would Mm -hmm. put um, electric company on in the meeting room and the inmates would watch along with their children. And then they were able to have these conversations about the show and reading and perhaps even helping the parent um, with some liter with some literacy skills. Mm -hmm. And they were actually the producers were aghast when they found that sometimes no, not sometimes, but oftentimes teachers were not using electric company in the classroom for the struggling readers. They were using it as a reward for the best performers in the class. <laughs> oh no, you get to go watch electric company. And they're like, no, 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 no that's, that's not, not how it works. For. Right, right. That's not what this is for. Okay. So let's go through what they were trying to teach us and how, how were they trying to teach us this stuff by reviewing some of the most memorable characters and sketches from the electric company? All right. Well, as I shared earlier, you guys, probably one of my favorite, if not my favorite character was Fargo North Decoder. Fargo North Decoder, messages decoded while you wait. (laughs) So clever. (laughs) I mean, right there. And I enjoyed the plot and all of that, but I was actually, who knew, learning decoding skills and the importance of like punctuation during these clever skits. Mm -hmm. It was Mm -hmm. so woven in, in such a clever way. I just... As I've said, just could yeah. not love him any more than I already do. And I recently heard an interview with Skip Hinnant. That was the actor who mm-hmm. played Fargo. Um, and he said that the part was originally written for Morgan Freeman. Mm-hmm. And they were sitting around kind of doing a table read looking at the skit. And Skip read the lines as if he was Don Adams from Get Smart. He had that kind of <laughs> right, um, right. accent and delivery. And that sealed the deal. From then on, he was cast and known as Fargo North, and he was the only character, believe it or not, from the Electric Company ever to be merchandised. So there was a board game that um, had him as the main character, as well as a Peter Pan record book set. So if you remember, the Peter Pan books were the ones that, you know, boop, boop, and then we would turn the page. (laughs) And so there was a Fargo North decoder Peter Pan book record set. You laugh every time you say it. And honestly, you guys, Fargo so much North. of that stuff went over the, over my oh, head. Oh, I know. And I remember the day, I think I was probably in college, when I went, Fargo North Decoder. Oh, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> like, it took me until I was an adult to right, figure yeah. out what that and was. And I'm not sure I, I would have, I knew it then either. It was one of those like, oh, I get it now. <laughs> Which just makes it all the more clever. And Skip said that after the last taping of um, The Electric Company, the final episode, that he asked and was given permission, and he took the trench coat and the hat with him, and he still has them today. Oh, that's sweet. That, that sweet? should go into, like, the Smithsonian when he dies. 
Yeah, they should. Mm -hmm. I know. Fargo, North nice. Dakota. That's right. Um, there was also Spider-Man, who I didn't think that I had any feelings about Spider-Man whatsoever. He just appeared on the screen. He came and he went. But what I do remember, and I am very attached to, is the theme song. Which was, Spider-Man, where are you coming from? Spider-Man, nobody knows who you are. <laughs> it was just so, I'm sure you'll drop that in instead of having me sing it. I don't know. I, I just like it. Spider-Man. So, Spider-Man was actually a gift to Electric Company from Stan Lee, the creator of, of Spider-Man. Um, and that seems like it would be a wonderfully good-hearted thing to do, which it was. But he's no dummy. He knows that in order to sell comic books... He needs kids to know how to read. So he's going to contribute his Spider-Man character mm -hmm. in an effort to get more children reading so they can buy more comic books. Um, but Spider-Man never spoke. Spider-Man just had speech balloons appear over his head like mm -hmm. animated speech balloons so that the children uh, sitting on the shag carpeting in front of the TV would read the speech balloons. Well, did you know that they, um, so Marvel Comics and Electric mm -hmm. Company had a series of actual comic books where they combined the characters. So, um, did you know that Valerie, the librarian, do you remember Valerie, the librarian? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, her character was in the comic books. She became the first spider woman in Marvel comic history. Wow. I did not know that. Well, probably one of my favorite characters, um, played by Rita Moreno was Otto, the director. She's mm -hmm. dressed like the stereotypical director with a little crop, like jawed for pants with the Argyle socks and the, you know, little director's hat. She has her giant megaphone and her, and her big pointer. And, um, she's very short tempered. And <laughs> basically, um, anytime auto, uh, there's an auto director, the director skit, her actors don't know what they're saying. They keep messing up their lines and she just goes bananas and she's constantly going and the giant cue cards, you know, she, she's pointing at them and she's pointing and, you know, jabbing the, the, the pointer at it. And she's trying to get them <laughs> to say the word they keep missing. And every time they say it, and it's usually just something very simple and like it's just all. repetitive. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. here we go back with these wonderful tools. This is just repetitive teaching of mm -hmm. these words of maybe a three word phrase. And it could just be like, shine my shoes. And, you know, when she yells, action, you know, kind of in that, hey, you guys voice, and the actor will start saying his lines. And when he gets to that part, it'll be like, shine my bicycle. <laughs> and, you know, she'll just go, cut, cut. And she goes bananas. And then back comes the cue card with shine my shoes. And she's So then you get to look at the board on the right. cue card every time. Every time. And you look at the word. At, as yes. she says it, she's pointing, shine my shoes. That's all you have to say. And, you know, action. And once again, he's like, blah, 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 you know, shine my cat. And, you know, she's like, no. So it just, it cracked me up. The humor was so funny. But again, it's teaching us because, you know, by the end of it, we're, we're able to, we're able to recognize shine my shoes. And I think I remember, you know, yelling at the TV by the end, like, shine, yes. my, like shine you're trying my to help shoes. the person. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, how so, could it be so dumb? Right. He says it right there. Well, yeah, like we were, um, we talked about before. So Judy Grobart, who hailed from Second City, had mm -hmm. some great improv skills. But you can see that. You can see her doing, because she's a very calm actress, and you can see her just going with, like, yes, and. Mm -hmm. We right. had Rita Moreno, who was screaming, and Judy Grabert, like, yes, and. Oh, okay. All right. We'll go over here. Okay. Yeah. And so Judy Grabert is the, she did Jennifer of the Jungle. And Jennifer of the Jungle was a play on George of the Jungle, which, of course, I did not know. Um, and yeah. she's always helping Paul the Gorilla with right. some word that he's struggling with or, or whatever. Paul the Gorilla was named after one of the head writers, or actually one of the main creators of the show, who was Paul Dooley. This is an interesting connection. Paul Dooley, the creator of Electric Company, coincidentally also played the dads in the movies Breaking Away and the dad in 16 Candles. So the dad oh. in 16 Candles, Molly Ringwald's wow. dad, is the creator of Electric Company. Oh, my gosh. You put yes. me to shame, Kristen. This is I'm these, so proud. This is a big day for me. That's crazy. Is that what you I know. <laughs> that is crazy. That is you crazy. Guys, you know what? Yeah. By well, by the time we've done a year of these episodes, I think we can come up with one of our own, you know, like this, um, se what is it? The seven degrees of Kevin Bacon or, or yeah. how many degrees? Three degrees? How many? I well, forgot I think how many it was, it was. Six. 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 Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it was six degrees, yeah, of Kevin Bacon. We would be able to come up with our own with yeah. like pop culture. Maybe it mm -hmm. all always goes back to John Sebastian or it all <laughs> always goes back <laughs> Garth to Garth Williams. Williams. Yes. Yeah. Somehow, <laughs> I bet you if we really thought about it, we could connect 
duly back to John Sebastian. I, we can do it. I'm on we it. can do it. But in an interview um, that I heard again with Judy, she was hysterical and it was just taped last year or whatever. So she's in her 80s, I think, late 70s. Oh, wow. Aww. But she was saying that some of the costumes they had to wear were kind of flimsy. And Jennifer the Jungle might have been one of them. And the studios were kind of cold. So they would have to put tape over their nipples. Oh, no. (laughs) Yes. To um, hide anything that might protrude from their costumes. Oh, poor Jennifer of the Jungle. I know. But I thought that was a fun little fact. (laughs) Something we wouldn't have picked up on. No. Okay, another one of my favorites is Letterman. The Adventures of Letterman. And you will all remember Letterman from its famous opening, which is faster than a rolling O, stronger than a silent E, able to leap capital T in a single bound. It's a word. It's a plan. <laughs> it's Letterman, which was famously narrated by Joan Rivers. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, who has said that she did it for her daughter, Melissa. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. Melissa Rivers is probably around our age, too. And like we said, that they donated their time. And so we never see Joan Rivers in Electric Company. We only hear her voice. Mm-hmm. And so she was doing this for the children. So the narrator, Joan Rivers, in Letterman, she describes a simple everyday situation, like people sitting in the park enjoying custard. And then the spellbinder the evil villain would use his magic wand to change a key letter in a word describing the situation in order to wreak havoc. And so he might change the letter C in custard to an M so that all the people enjoying their custard are now (laughs) eating mustard. Mustard. And that's when Letterman appears, famously voiced by Gene Wilder. Mm -hmm. Again, we had no idea. And he would always come on the scene with a very mild-mannered, I'm Letterman. He replaces the incorrect letter with a more appropriate one ripped from the chest of his varsity sweater, and everything goes back to normal. Yay! So the spellbinder, and when I saw the word spellbinder, that was another one of those tumble back in time things where I was like, oh my God, spellbinder. I haven't thought of spellbinder for 45 years. Um, the spellbinder has been criticized as being a negative racial stereotype who resembles those turbaned Arabs in the escapist Arabian Nights films of the 50s and 60s. I thought he wore a turban because he was a magic person. Like, like it's a top hat. Like you're going to pull a mm-hmm. rabbit out of your mm-hmm. hat. Um, Spellbinder also, by the way, this is an all-star cast letterman in is Spellbinder was voiced by Zero Mostel from Fiddler on the Roof. Wow. I mean, how many of us didn't have that Fiddler on the Roof album that said with Zero Mostel? <laughs> I feel like you just bought it recently, didn't you? I did. I bought it in Chicago. <laughs> yeah. I think probably the skit that most everybody associates still to this day with the electric company um, comes by many names. Um, it, you could call it soft shoe, soft shoe silhouettes. You could call it the shadow box. You could call it the silhouette blend. But, you know, that's just a very simple silhouetted view, side view of two fa- faces saying parts of words. And then they blend them together and say them in unison while the word appears at the top of the the screen. <laughs> At chat. chat in chin. That's one that people I think all the time associate with the electric company. I loved it. It was so effective. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just not a, a, not just for compound words, but just for being like the beginning letter of a word. You know, d og dog dog d ig dig You know, it's just it's just so simple. Did you guys play this with your friends? Shh. It. it. Shit. <laughs> Shit. Oh, all the time. Of Boop. course. Boob. Yeah. Boob. <laughs> it's still Boop. fun. What do you, At, what do you mean? <laughs> did I play it with my friends? <laughs> Why are we I talking past tense? Yes. Right. <laughs> we play it all the time in our house. <laughs> oh, God. We thought we were so funny. Uh huh. It just popped into my mind as we were, as I was visualizing um, the silhouettes saying those um, letter blends. Was do you remember doing silhouettes in like elementary school and kindergarten where you'd put your yes. head down on this and the teacher yes. would yes. trace or you'd have it I guess on the wall and then no you, you didn't put your head down no. they just did a shadow they did yeah a, you they sit put in a, a chair <laughs> yeah with a <laughs> yeah. piece of paper that? and there's a light. I swear, my mom put my head down on a piece of paper. It was a black piece of paper, and they traced our around our face with a with a piece of chalk. Yes, I swear, on a black piece of paper. 
I see. Ours were more sophisticated, I'm just apparently. I just like a my... crime scene <laughs> where Carolyn's laying down. You have to with lay like this. Head sideways. Okay. Yeah. If this does make it in, I want any of you listeners who also put their head on a piece of paper and were traced around it. Because I don't think that would even work. Let me know. It's your silhouette. <laughs> <laughs> Your features. You'd have to have a really long piece of chalk so to do long. that. So long because when your face is sideways, your nose is a good like five inches yes. from the paper. They just like <laughs> you look like a gorilla. No, think or about something. it. If your face is sideways <laughs> on the paper. Your nose is like way away from it. Okay. Uh, so the way they I... did it with us, we did ours on black paper too, but the way they did it is they, they did it with like a shadow. Right. And then they traced it and then you cut that out of the white paper and then they put it on the black paper and then we traced that with a white crayon and then cut it out. I remember sitting in front of a very bright light. <laughs> well, in, in profile. Well, somebody drew on the paper yeah. behind me. Well, you guys, we've talked about this a few times, you know, these pop culture references that we don't think a whole lot of other people get. And I think about the skit, um, it's the plumber, I've come to fix the sink. And anytime- <laughs> It's the plumber, I come to fix the sink. Yeah, see, you're so good at that. But anytime I, I hear- saying it. Anytime I hear, who is it? I want to say- <laughs> Who is it? It's the plumber, I've come to fix the sink. <laughs> It's the plumber. Okay. I come to fix the sink. I am. You're good at the little impersonation. It's the plumber. Who is it? <laughs> yeah. Who is it? It's the plumber. It's the plumber. I come, I come to, come fix, to the fix the sink. The sink. <laughs> right. And he has to say that over and over again. And he is becoming. Clearly, in- we still enjoy it. <laughs> we'll keep <laughs> saying it. He's becoming increasingly. Don't you dare <laughs> dub that in. <laughs> right. You, you keep us no, in No, I'm keeping you in there. So. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think we were learning from that skit? Do you guys have any I um, have no clue? idea. And honestly, I did not even know that came from Electric Company. And yet clearly so everybody much. knows it. This is what I learned. If you look at the speech bubbles, when the first time that he knocks and the parrot says, is it a parrot or a parakeet? Ooh, a parrot. Yeah, it's a parrot. Yeah. It's a parrot. Ooh, is it? There's a question mark after who is it? And he says... <gasps> oh. It's the plumber, right. period. I've come to fix the sink, period. Period. Right. Mm-hmm. And then he gets increasingly frustrated because our parrot keeps asking, who is it? And he keeps saying that, but he has to change his inflection and in how he's saying it. So we see an exclamation point added at one point. So oh, it's the plumber. I've come to fix the sink. And then till we get to two exclamation points at the end where it's, it's the plumber. I've come to fix the sink. But I can't do the <laughs> accent. So if one of you can or the. And then, and then we go back to the very end where they say, well, did anybody come? Did right. anybody call? And then the parrot just says. It's a plumber. He came to he fix, came the, to fix the sink. That's right. And do you? <laughs> I also think, but I, I totally agree with you. I didn't think about that. That with the punctuation, I didn't but with that, most but yes. of the electric company skits, you guys, it's just the repetitiveness and the showing the words right. as they say them. So it's put. It's that visualization. It's that connecting of what you're hearing with what you're seeing, and just by seeing, you know, the word sink that many times. Pretty soon, you're going to see sink on a piece of paper in a book, and you're going to know, oh, that's the word sink. Right. Well, and think about it. Every single – this is just occurring to me right now in this moment, because I was also going, what the hell were they teaching us? I have no idea. I think you're correct about the punctuation, but everything that they say is in a speech bubble. There was no animation that wasn't written above anybody's head mm-hmm. in most of the skits. Right. So we were looking at words in every single skit that they provided uh-huh. to us. Right. Because there usually was a certain blend that was in most of the skits. If it was a, mm-hmm, you know, right. a prefix or a suffix, or if it was just a beginning letter sound, everything was pretty consistent. And they also used those letter blends in the monolith cartoon. So here's what the monolith cartoon was. And you'll remember it because those words I'm sure mean nothing to you. So there's always the beginning of the monolith cartoon, there's always an an adorable little gaggle of aliens. And they look different each time. The aliens are different aliens in each cartoon. And they're always like, (laughs) they don't say any words. Um, But they're alarmed by a very large rectangular pillar of rock, just like you see in the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey. And it's accompanied by the music of 2001 A Space Odyssey, which I think is called, is it Zarathustra? You know what I'm talking about. Very dramatic. Isn't that the da da Yes. Da-da. Da-da. Yeah. 
So then the pillar of rock would begin to shudder and collapse and crumble, eventually revealing that letter combo of the day, whatever the phoneme of the day that's was. That's right. That's so if right. it's, the, you know, there's an AI that is revealed from the crumbling pillar of, lo- of rock and then a big booming voice, they'd go bump, 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 bump. And then a big uh-huh. voice, the voice would go, hey, <laughs> <laughs> that's the whole thing. Hey. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, another clever way they taught some reading skills was through song. And mm-hmm. two of my favorites, Silent E and L.Y., so those are two separate songs, were written by Tom. Trying really Le- hard not to sing right now. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I would love for you to sing. I'll probably put in a clip, but if, if you would like to sing, you can certainly try it. You can take a tub into a tube. <laughs> you can make a can. Into, into a, a cane. cane Who can turn a pan Into a pain It's not too hard to see It's silent And my favorite one was you could turn a, hu- a hug Into huge And it was like a huge, a huge hug And Aww. I loved that um, And so Tom Lear wrote both of those songs That were so catchy They kind of had a um, schoolhouse rock vibe to them So that was Silent E And then Kristen, would you do you remember any of the L.Y. song? Um, okay, yes, I remember it. It's like something Lee, something right. Lee, something L Y. Like, how do you walk? There's a tiger in the room, yep. and something, something. How do you get past? <laughs> I'm making this up completely. How well, do you get close. past the tiger so he doesn't eat you? Oh. Quietly, <laughs> quietly, well, it's silently, quiet, but yeah. L Y. And right there, taking a snooze is a tiger. So, how do you walk on by? Silently. Silently, silent, L-Y. You guys, we were learning adverbs. We were learning that when you talk about how you do something by adding L-Y, you're describing the action. And the tune is so catchy and upbeat that you would never forget it. So and I, those songs are with us today. They are. 50 years later. Not only do we know those songs, but we love those songs. Yes. I can just imagine, like, can you picture that letter E with his little legs yes. and his little hands and he's got a little wand and mm-hmm. he's like changing a tub into a tube mm-hmm. and a can into a cane with his little magic wand. Right. Oh, I love yeah. that little silent E. He was so cute. You know what I kind of think I remember, um, too, is really that was where I learned to really think language like that was like pretty amazing. I mean, not to sound too. <laughs> too old for my age, but I, I, I think especially with the silent E song and where you would change a tub into a tube or a can into a cane. But it also, I think for me was making me really kind of astounded. Like, wow, language is like words, spelling. This is kind of, this is kind of amazing. I love that. And I also think like you, Michelle, I really think I can probably trace back my love of words and playing with them and how they could be kind of manipulated um, to the electric company. I uh-huh. think maybe becoming a language arts teacher and a writer um, can all be traced back to seeing how fun this could be and how right. um, magical it could be. Wow. Right. That's really trippy to think about, like how the three of us could be in the careers that we have because of the electric yeah. company. We're like word people. And I think that brings us to probably the most famous. Oh my gosh! Okay, I'm gonna let me just say this and see if you guys know who I'm talking about. Top to bottom, left to right, reading stuff is out of sight. (laughs) Top to bottom, left to right, that reading stuff is out of sight. Ah. Easy reader, that's my name. Ah, ah, ah. Ooh yeah. (laughs) I'm talking about Easy Reader. <laughs> ah, Easy Reader, a smooth hipster who loved reading. Um, of course, played by Morgan Freeman. Of course. Um, and you know, the character's name, Easy Reader, was a, like many of the things we've just said, many of the characters we've just talked about was a pun on the movie Easy Rider. I had no um, idea. No yeah. idea. Well, of course we didn't. That I didn't know that until like yesterday. I but, had you know, no idea. I don't know how fun for the writers in the writer's room coming mm-hmm. up with all this stuff, right? Um, we often saw Easy Reader um, with Vi and her diner or with Valerie the librarian. Um, and, you know, this is where Morgan Freeman, re- his coolness factor could really shine. Rita Moreno called Morgan Freeman the coolest, the most 
elegant fellow on the show. Um, she said they wrote the Easy Reader song together, but it was Morgan Freeman who put in the uh. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, yeah. So you know how when he says "Easy Reader," that's my name. Uh, 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 uh. Reading, reading, that's my game. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, his his clothes were so cool. When we're growing out of the Big Bird and the Burton Ernie and the Cookie Monster era, I think it was really important for us to have cool characters like that. I felt like they were my first cool teachers. Yeah, again, not dumbing it down for the kids, right? Mm -hmm. I think my favorite line that Easy Reader ever said was, I got to go see my main squeeze at the library. <laughs> like, he's making the library yes. sexy. Yeah. And then he goes to the library, and the librarian is his girlfriend. Yes. And they kiss in the library. Mm -hmm. It was hot. You know it's what, hot. though? I, when I was just rewatching some, um, electric company clips in preparation for this episode, some things that went over my head, you guys, I watched several skits where it was interracial couples mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. went right over my head in, in the early seventies. Thankful. I mean, of course it did. I was a child. And as we all right. know, children, that's not anything. People love that, each other. Yeah. Right. Love is love, which it right. still is. But what I'm saying is watching it now, I was like, Wow, that's like, I wanted to like, you know, give them a slow standing, you know, oh, for like, good on you, electric company for back in 1971. It was just no big deal. You know, the doorbell rings and, you know, it's, it's, it's a the black loudspeaker. woman and a white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was the loudspeaker oh, one I, that I was one watching. One of my yes. favorite skits. <laughs> and I'll show you. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And he had ordered it for his hi fi. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes. I'm your loudspeaker. So, Hattie Winston, who played Valerie the Librarian, and then Skip Hennett was the guy right, who right, ordered yeah. the loudspeaker. Here's an interesting fact that in all, in a lot of the research and all the things that I could find was that the first televised interracial couple between a um, a black actor and a Caucasian actor has always been attributed to Helen and Tom Willis from the Jeffersons, which didn't air until 1975. If you really want to get down to the nitty gritty, it appears that the first interracial black white couple would have been on the electric right. company. company. Yes. Yeah. Before the Before Willises. The Willises. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I agree. And yeah. I'm thinking too, just on an aside, that, you know, poor librarians always are, we think of them as the spinsters, like, you know, totally. and yeah. um, it's a wonderful life when Mary's And Mary also the, white. Yeah. Yeah. And white. Mm hmm. But now they made the librarian sexy. Sexy. In the lecture company. Yes. And she totally. even kissed someone in the library. In the library. Oh That's my right. God. Those two were just fantastic. I actually heard somebody say in a documentary, very astutely say, this is so perfect, you guys. The only guy cooler than Easy Reader in the 70s was the Fonz. <laughs> wow. Okay, so PBS broadcast the 780 episodes over the course of its six seasons from 1971 to 77. But after it ceased production in 1977, the program continued in reruns until 1985. And this was because of a deal that they had made with the powers that be that the last two seasons could be run in perpetuity. This was their educational intention. This was not a money-making scheme. This was their intention to continue educating the children. Um, and the series re-ran again on Noggin for just a very short time, 1999 to 2002, because I did not realize this, but Noggin was co-founded by the Children's Television Workshop. But hmm. then after 2002, it kind of disappeared. But people theorize that maybe the reason that it disappeared like that is because it was so of the 70s. It was so groovy that it just didn't age well. It is really seventies, but in one of the, one of the interviews I was watching, I want to say it was Skip Hennett who was saying the clothes are dated, the hairstyles are dated. He was saying they've created something that can last forever because the lessons will always be the same. I and totally I agree. agree. I, totally I totally agree. agree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Essentially, the it's always company, funny. That's, it's that, always that, funny. that same humor is still yes, funny. And I guarantee you, six year olds will still think that's funny. 
I agree with you. Um, essentially, the electric company, it's a its a time capsule. It could, it could be, you guys, the grooviest show that's ever been on TV. Uh-huh. It's a treasure trove of early 70s fashion, hairstyles, slang, attitudes, and causes. And like you said, Carolyn, there was not just representation in name, but also in spirit. Like, this was my introduction to the black community. Because I lived in a small farming town that was full of white people. And the people of color on electric company, they owned that stage. You Mm -hmm. could feel it. They were bringing it. And Mm -hmm. we, Gen Xers, were the beneficiaries of that. Yeah, definitely. I agree. And watching again just brought back so many warm, great memories. That's one of the reasons I love doing this podcast is that I get to revisit these moments from my youth, but with an adult set of eyes. So looking Uh at the electric company, feeling that nostalgia, as we just talked about, but also as an educator, as an as a parent, really appreciating what that program was about and the thought that went into it and just, again, how clever and witty it was. Um, yeah. I just think that's really a really fun part of doing this podcast. I agree. It is so It is so nice to go back in time and look at the things from our childhood and think, wow, I am really grateful for that. Because I am really grateful for the electric company. How lucky I was to be their target audience. I mean, we, it's like we landed on the planet at the right time, you guys. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening today. We hope you enjoyed the show. And please join us next time when we'll be counting down the top 10 teen idols of the Tiger Beat era. We're going to try. <laughs> oh, my God. Can I squeal like an 11-year-old girl yes, here? Yes, you <laughs> I can't wait for that episode. You guys. I know. Um, and oh, yes, um, it's here I am again asking you all to please share your love of our podcast. Follow our super fun social media pages. And oh, my goodness, you guys, I now have another request. Sign up for even more fun PCPS and Gen X news delivered straight to your inbox. You can sign up easily via our website at poppreservationists.com. In the meantime, let's raise our glasses for a toast. Courtesy of the cast of Three's Company, Jack, Janet, and Chrissy. Two good times. Two happy days. Two little house on the prairie. Cheers. 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 Information, opinions, and comments expressed on the Pop Culture Preservation Society podcast belong solely to me, the Crushologist, and Carolyn and Hello Newman, and are in no way representative of our employers or affiliates. And though we truly believe we are always right, I guess there's always a first time. The PCPS is written, produced, and recorded at Modern Well, a woman-centered co-working space in Minneapolis, Minnesota, home of the fictional WJM Studios and our beloved Mary Richards. Nanu Nanu, keep on trucking, and may the force be with you. We get a happy feeling when we're singing a song